Good afternoon, and welcome to week four of 10 Weeks in Jamaica, Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World. I'm Magalina, co-founder and co-artistic director of Akiba Abaka Arts. We are an international theater production company that creates plays, concerts, talks, and processes for making plays, concerts, and talks for the global stage. This series is presented in partnership with Raw Management Agency, an esteemed talent agency representing artists and groups across all genres in film, television, theater, voiceovers, branding, and endorsements. We are very grateful to work in collaboration with Ms. Nadine Rollins, Raw Management's Managing Director and Co-Curator for 10 Weeks in Jamaica. 10 Weeks in Jamaica, Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World, is a talk series that shares the behind the scenes stories of Jamaica's theater community with the global theater community and members of the Jamaican and Caribbean diaspora. Each week, Jamaica's leading theater pioneers and practitioners narrate their histories and memories of the Jamaican stage and offer their visions for the future development of theater in this 21st century. This series is made possible by our sponsors and publisher HowlRound.com, a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide that amplifies progressive, disruptive ideas about art form and facilitates connections between diverse theater practitioners. 10 Weeks in Jamaica is also sponsored by Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the City University of New York in Manhattan. The Siegel Center is a home to theater artists, scholars, students, performing arts managers, and the local and international performance communities. Now, whether you're joining us for the first time or you've been watching weekly since we started the series on November 1st, we thank you very much for being in our audience today and hope that you will return weekly through the end of the series on January 3rd. Please, if you would be so kind as to continue to join us and be updated on everything by subscribing to the button, by so hitting the subscribe button to become part of our growing family and to click the notification button below, you know, that cute little bell to get reminders on upcoming episodes and engagements from our channel. And while you're at it, go ahead and follow us on Facebook, on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at Akiba Abaka Arts. Now, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce my partner and co-founder and co-artistic director, Akiba Abaka, a distinguished director, dramatist, producer, actor, arts educator. I can go on and on. Uh -huh. Akiba has been bringing theater to diverse communities throughout her 20 plus year career. Akiba will be your host and moderator for today's conversation. Hey, Akiba. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Week four. Week four. We want to learn some more in week four. <laughs> I have my notebook and my pen ready because this is a lesson. You know, when you have theater practitioners, like we have today, I'm not going to spoil, I'm not going to say anything, although if they saw the slides and they already know, but um, you need to take notes and you need to learn. And so today, my notebook. look at okay. you. And I'm moderating. You're not going to want up me. I have my okay. stuff too. Okay. I'm, notebook out. I'm ready. Okay. Awesome. Take it away, Akiva. <laughs> Thank you so much, Magalie. There is no business like show business, and show business is a huge part of Brand Jamaica. Today's conversation features the people who are least often seen, but most responsible for everything that you see in the theater. The producers. From Brooklyn to Beijing, from Chile to Canada, and all cities and countries in between, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the livelihood of theater producers and people that they employ and serve. All New York City Broadway shows are closed until May, 20, 20, until May 2021. And theaters in London's, London's West End are closed indefinitely. 
Market Watch is reporting that the creative industry sector in the UK is projected to lose over 74 billion pounds or 94 billion US dollars. London's Creative Industries Federation predicts that over 400,000 creative jobs will be lost as a result of the pandemic. Theater pra practitioners are waiting patiently in the wings for the next act in this COVID-19 drama, which will be brought on by more social distancing and vaccines. Today, we are joined by an esteemed panel of three of Jamaica's most successful theater producers for a discussion on the repertory and commercial theater in Jamaica since the little theater movement pantomime and the onset of Roots Theater. English-born Jamaican actor Glenn Titus Campbell, OD, Order of Distinction through Service Officer Class, has been performing commercially for over 39 years. He became a household name among Jamaicans locally and overseas when he was featured in the sitcom, Titus Come to Town, T excuse me, Titus in Town, which aired on the Jamaican Broadcast Corporation. Mr. Campbell has performed in more than 70 stage productions. Most notable productions include Smile Orange by Trevor Roan, Ross Noah and the Hawk, and Love Games by Patrick Brown. Mr. Campbell's television and film credits include Third World Cop, Going to Extremes on ABC, Small Island on the BBC One, and, recent, and the recently released uh, Jamaican feature film Sprinter, produced by Will Smith. He is a company director for Jambiz International Limited and national adjudicator for the, the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, JCDC, speech and drama competitions. Welcome, Glenn. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? A pleasant how do you do to you, sir? Wagwan. <laughs> Day, man. Day, yes, sir. Andrew Roach has been in the business of theater for over 35 years. He started as stage manager in the gin with Ginger Knight in Boy Blue, starring Oliver Samuel. He has stage managed for Jambiz International and Blue Mountain Productions in the UK. Roach wrote and produced Strength of a Woman, and that which won the best comedy. Uh, award for the ITI Actor Boy Awards. Andrew Roach is currently the artistic director and of Whirlwind Group of Companies for the past five years. Welcome, Andrew. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm happy to be here. We are happy to be How are you, sir? <laughs> Big up yourself, Roach. <laughs> uh, <laughs> awesome. Lenford Salmon is one of the founding directors of Jambiz International, having started the organization in 1998. He holds a master's degree in business administration from the University of the West Indies and is primarily responsible for sales and marketing of Jambiz International. He started his career in entertainment as an actor back in the 1970s and has performed in numerous productions on stage and in film and television. No longer acting, Mr. Salmon spends most of his time actively involved in the business of theater. Welcome, Lenford. All right. Gentlemen, before we begin, I'm going to start by uh, mapping the Jamaican theater scene. Um, just to give our viewers a picture of, of what we're talking about, where Kingston is concerned. So Kingston is the is in the southeastern region of the island, correct? That's correct. Awesome. And so for those of us who haven't been home in a while, who left Jamaica when our eyes were literally where our knees are today, 
<laughs> when I, I was at our knee, um, or those of us who haven't been to Kingston. When you come in to Kingston from the Norman Manley Airport, that long strip of road taking you into town, you get to the first neighborhood, which is Harborview. You take a left, and you follow that road all the way into downtown Kingston, right? You're on track. Yes. Yeah, and, then, sorry. and then we come up in the, the area that we've been talking about a few weeks ago, the North Parade area where the uh, Ward Theater is. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yep. All right. So now that area and the waterfront is what you're calling downtown, downtown Kingston. And then we go, we keep going north up to halfway tree and then over to new Kingston. So downtown Kingston is old Kingston. And then after you pass half a tree, you, you get into new Kingston or the corporate area, correct? Well, the entire thing is regarded as a corporate area, but oh, you okay. are perfectly right in having that kind of distinction. Um, just for the history buffs, yes. Kingston, Kingston proper, actually goes up to what is called Turnton Bridge, which is just a little below Crossroads. That's actually the parish. Kingston is actually a parish in its own right, you know. Okay. So the suburbs, a... uh, absolutely. The suburbs above Crossroads is actually the parish of St. Andrew. But because one municipality governs, it's, called, it's actually called the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation. Okay. Um, it's, 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 it has come over time to be regarded as one parish, but it's actually two parishes. Okay, okay. See, no, I learned something new every single day, even though I was born right there under the clock in halfway halfway tree. As they say, when you're born in the city, you're born under yeah, the so, <laughs> so I, I don't want to burst your bubble, but Afro Tree isn't properly in, in Kingston, actually. Afro Tree is in St. Andrew. Oh, also St. Andrew, my bond. I did that bit of mapping because um, I know that many of the theaters are in the corporate area as opposed to the downtown area, where in many cities, the theaters are in the downtown area. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But we, I wanted to just give that snapshot so you get the feeling of where we are. So downtown is by the water and uptown is near the mountains. If you keep going past uptown, you end up in, blue, in the beautiful blue mountains. Yeah, so, that's a good distinction. That's a good way to put it, all right. Remember yeah. mm -hmm. something. <laughs> Glenn, yes. you are known throughout the Caribbean and, the, and its diaspora as a top-notch actor. And according to your fan base on Instagram, a real G. <laughs> How did you come to start producing theater um, on such a large stage, a uh, large scale, from actor to producer. How did that take place? All right, so um, I have the distinction of having started in theatre when most of us did as a hobby. I was going to Jamaica College at the time, and you leave from school and you go to a rehearsal and you make theatre in the evenings or on weekends. Um, I then went into the corporate world, spent some 12 years um, in corporate theater with one of the public utility companies. And then I also left from that and went into public relations. And then I managed a nightclub. And so I got my exposure to business and, you know, seeing how the tables, how, how, how the machinery runs. And so I decided that when Jambis was formed in 1998, Lenford Salmon, Patrick Brown, Trevor Nairn, and they incorporated me as their lead actor, I, I started to get have this itch to do a little more, you know, be a part of the making of theatre and the business of theatre, which is one of the reasons we formed Jambis. All of us had years of experience before in theatre, but we said that let's make theatre a business. Let's take it from just where it's just a hobby for everyone. Let's see if we can make some money out of this and take care of our families. And so uh, more and more, along with Lenford's um, guidance and assistance, I started to go into the business side of things. And by little, I started to take stuff from him. You know, I'd start be in charge of the rehearsal um, preparation. And so he'd give me a budget for rehearsals. And then when we go into production, um, I'd start to put down my foot and say, Patrick and Trevor, because you know, creatives, they tend not to have any conscience when it comes to spending money. So, Patrick, <laughs> all right. Um, we're having a production, we're having a 
meal, a family sitting down to dinner, and four people going to eat food, and he wants this big spread. I'm the one that said, eh, eh. <laughs> nah. so, no, they're on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> big spread over 200 performances is going to cost you so much. And I said, oh, so this young man has a knack for being stingy and tight with the money. Okay, we'll put him in charge of the money. And so that's how it kind of evolved into my being on the production side of things and kind of still being lead actor, but now also having the cap as being producer as well. Awesome. Andrew, like Glenn, you are also an artist entrepreneur, often serving as playwright and director for Worldwind. But you pride yourself as being a businessman first. How do you reconcile the distinction between artist and commercial theater producer? All right. Um, as an artist, most of the artists has this sentiment um, to the art. Some of them, it doesn't matter if they make a dollar from it. The love of it alone carry them through. Now, as Glenn said, we have families to feed. Um, in Jamaica, when people recognize you as a Glenn Campbell, uh, 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 um, Salmon, Lenford Salmon, as an Andrew wrote, you have to carry yourself in a particular way. And it costs money to, to do that. Yeah. Right? So um, we now have to go into the business of not just the love of the theater, but to make money from it. So that alone drives you to the other aspect of theater, producing, where um, the bulk of the money, I think, is made from producing. So that's how I end up in that aspect of it. And, and moreover, when you tour with somebody like Oliver Samuels, um, who does not have the time to do the business aspect of things, you find yourself as stage manager doing the business for him also. So um, things like those brought me to another level of theater, which is the business aspect of theater. And um, here I am. Awesome. Lenford, a couple of weeks ago, we had Anya Gludon and Dr. Deborah Hickling Gordon on the show. And these are two daughters of the Little Theater Movement pantomime uh, stage. Mm -hmm. Your history in theater also began with LTM pantomime. Tell us about your transition from acting to producing. Yeah, I actually learned quite a lot. Um, I spent 12 years um, in, with the Little Theater. Well, 12 years on stage. Mm. Um, accumulatively, I was with the Little Theater for about 20 years because um, I kind of graduated into management at the Little Theater um, under the tutelage and guidance of um, Professor Rest Nettleford, um, Mrs. Mrs. Gludon, um, Keith Emil, um, Wycliffe Bennett, um, those kinds of stalwarts of the of the movement. Um, George Carter. Um, so I, I I was a student and had a keen interest in the business side of things at Little Theatre whilst I was on stage. Um, they did recognize that I had that interest because at the time I was actually studying studying business, mm. and um, I kind of got the opportunity from being involved with the Little Theatre movement to actually help to produce to produce the um, the national pantomime. Um, what is little known is that. Professor Russ Nettleford, um, who spent most of his time at the University of the West Indies, actually pulled me one side one day and said to me, son, you know they don't really have any great respect for artists, right? I said, yes, sir, I'm well aware. They don't really think too many of us have much sense, you know. Um, I said, yes, you get that kind of condescending kind of approach from time to time. And he said, um, by the time I had met him, I was I had already um, completed some college um, studies at the, what was then known as the College of Art, Science and Technology, CAST, which is now the University of Technology. So I had I had a I had a college um, a college um, um, diploma at the time, and he encouraged me. He said, "Look, um, get yourself to be a scholar because it's the only time." when people take you seriously, even in the theater, even if you're going to study theater. Because I said, sir, my interest is not in studying too much. By, I, I, I get pretty bored by this thing called studies. And he said, study what you love. 
Um, and, and Professor Nutterford was very instrumental in my, my time at the university. I eventually went to UWI to do a first degree, then a second degree, started some, some postgrad um, doctoral studies, turn what list, um, drop off the boat in terms of that. Um, I get cussing from time to time by all the professors there to come back to complete. Maybe one day the bug will bite me again. <laughs> um, so I, 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 my, my, my early work in producing was actually started and was, and was encouraged. And, um, and I got great help from people like George Carter and those others in terms of trying to understand the business of producing theater. So it, it actually goes, goes, goes away back. So by the time I had come to Jambes, um, I, I already had a, a sense of what producing theater was. Mm -hmm. And then but producing theater in the real commercial sense, because the little theater is not really a commercial entity. The little theater is a quasi-commercial. Um, it, it wants to pay its way, but the little theater was never intended to earn a profit and for people to benefit from that profit. Every dime that the little theater movement earns goes back into the development of the theater and, and, and in the arts in Jamaica generally. Because to upkeep the theater is a mighty expensive, a mighty, mighty expensive undertaking. They get no government sub, um, subvention. Mm -hmm. So they have to literally maintain that space by what comes out of the, the annual national pantomime. Um, regrettably, over time, the pantomime is not what it used to be anymore in terms of its attractiveness to an audience. So the struggles are even now more real than before um, in terms of maintaining that space called the little theater. Um, but that's perhaps for an entire different program because that's, um, that's apart from its controversial nature, it's just so it's a voluminous nature mm -hmm. to make that 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 analysis will be for an entirely different different evening altogether. It's own and we we had a little bit of a conversation about that two weeks ago when we talked about little, the little theater movement. So yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in in a nutshell, um, I, I, when I came to Jambes. Um, Patrick um, had been an established businessman for some years. Trevor Nairn had been an established theater practitioner for many years. Again, uh, it was to the uh, almost coming back to, to another university again. Um, I learned so much from these two gentlemen, from the, on the business side, from the artistic side. Um, Glenn has a reputation for being known as, as, as Titus, but although Patrick is not, is not as tight, but he has a, a, a very unique knack of, 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 of sensing what works and what doesn't work, mm -hmm. both artistically and business-wise. And I think Jambiz has benefited from his wise counsel in terms of how we have, we have operated throughout, throughout the years. So nice. I have learned on, 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 on many different fronts, um, tremendously from the Little Theatre Movement and from, and from the principal persons in Jambiz. Awesome. So you mentioned uh, Professor Rex Nettleford, and actually next week, we will be going into um, his contribution to the Jamaican stage. I actually had an opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Nettleford in 2000 on the steps of the Philip Sherlock Center. And everything you said, you sound just like him. That's exactly how he would roll up on students and tell us you know, what we needed to do and how we needed to focus our studies so that we would end up in the right career path. And not just a right career path, but a career path that would impact change and help build um, our nations wherever we were coming from in the world. So it's really great to hear that little bit of story about uh, Dr. Nett uh, Nettleford. Andrew, so we hear the, um, the foundation of what inspired, what called you to what I call the other side of the rehearsal hall the producer side. Tell me about your business model at Whirlwind. Um, how is the organization set up? Because you are more of a commercial uh, theater presenter. You, you all are. Um, tell us a little bit about your business model. All right. Um, for Whirlwind, um, Michael Dawson, who is the CEO, CEO of Whirlwind, has entered into... He has several businesses. Whirlwind is a, is a company with several entities. Um, the theater aspect is, is just one. No, we try to have theater be independent of, say, a, probably a Vibes Cartel clothing line or a Strictly Roots water. And he, we have strict principles that we have to adhere to in terms of um, how we operate the theater. 
as as a business, sometimes unlike we're unlike um Jambis who runs theater for themselves um right throughout the year, we would rent the theater also the theater space, right? So the theater has to be making money to sustain itself because a rental is not cheap in Jamaica and um, you have staff to pay and all the rest of it. So everything we can do to make that dollar for the theater we do. For example, we will rent the theater in the morning for church service. And then in the evening, we have plays, right? Um, not every day we, we, we um, have theater in the, in, the, in, the, in the theater space. We'll have parties, we'll have wedding reception, just about anything to keep the space paying for itself. And um, every entity, as I said, of Whirlwind has to pay its own way. So as the theater manager, I have to ensure that whatever I do, at the, come the end of the month, the books has to be balanced and the theater pays for itself. Yeah. We can do plays in there that probably 10 persons, 20 persons come to see these plays, but we have other things in terms of we would sponsor it with like our Strictly Roots Water, right? So if we televise it, the Strictly Roots Water get branding, which mm -hmm. in and of itself is commercial. So we, 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 we are flexible. We can do a lot of things um, with the space that we have. So you're doing the multi-use or multi-purpose space model where you have a right. theater, but inside of that complex, there are other businesses that right. are Definitely. operated within that complex. And the visibility Definitely. of each business brings audiences to the theater and the theater audience right. brings visibility and sales to your other businesses. So it's Definitely. strictly commercial. The till rings all the way around for you at Worldwind. That's, that's the way okay. we, we, we approach it. Okay, great. So Glenn and Lenford, tell us about your particular model um, and your business structure at Jambiz. Yeah, you want to go? I've, 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 I've probably. Oh, you, you, you go, go. I'll, I'll back you up. I'll back you up. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, as Glenn um, intimated earlier, towards the. We, we've all been doing theater for a very, very long time. Like I said, I spent several years in the, in the pantomime. Trevor has been around from, from, from theater, was created in, 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 in 1901. <laughs> um, so he's been around for a very, very, very long time. Trevor actually has been a long-standing tutor lecturer at the, at the Edemiley School of the Perform Visual and Performing Arts. That's Trevor Nairn, right? Playwright Trevor Nairn. Trevor, Nairn. Mm -hmm. Trevor Nairn. Um, Patrick does some, some lecture in there. I, I do some from time to time. Um, but so we, we, we started to do some production. I think I was invited, uh, when was Gova Jelly Glenn? Oh, oh boy, um, Gova Jelly was 1980-something. About yeah. um, 80, 80 something. You yeah. know, Guava Jelly came to Boston in the 90s to the Strand. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I was in, working in, on that show. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> um, so what about was 80. about 96, Lenny? About 96. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. That's Four. the that's that's the that's, that's a rebound. rebound. That's a rebound yeah. of Guava Jelly. Okay. Actually, I had I had the privilege of working on both of them. Right. The the no that's no that's the sec. The, the, there, there there have been three rebounds actually. Oh. Wow. Um, but the original Gova Jelly was in about 1987 at the Barn Theater. Yes. Um, with Glenn, Glenn alternating with, with Blacker Ellis and Rosie Murray and, and, and so on. Clive Anderson. Clive, I, I alternated with Clive with, 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 with Uzo at the time. Um, that was my first um, production with Trevor and Patrick. Um, they had a company at the time called Mass Pro that actually produced, produced um, Gova Jelly. But by and large, as Glenn said, it was a hobby. Patrick wasn't serious. So Patrick was, was Patrick is a trained um, civil engineer. Writing was his passion. He, 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 writing discovered him, uh, as he would want to call it, when he was pressured into writing an uh, end of year production when he was enrolled at the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies in his final, final year study as an engineer. And people loved it so much that eventually became a production which is called Friends eventually graduated into a production called Friends. Mm -hmm. And so writing found him, and he has not stopped writing since. He has actually literally almost given up being a civil engineer mm -hmm. and have taken on writing full time because he just loves it and doesn't want to go back to it, go to anything else. And um, we, 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 we sat down and we said, hey, folks, 
Um, we're doing this as a hobby, but have we ever recognized that um, entertainment is one of the biggest business in the world? And if we really get very serious about this thing, um, Patrick said, this is what I really love. We all said, boy, we, this is what we really love. We'd love to be able to do it and not having to go to a nine to five job. And we all said, well, let us, let us give it a go. Um, at the time, um, theater in Jamaica was dominated by small spaces, the big, the big little theater and so on. The pantomime was, was king at the time in the big theater. It was very hard to get into those theater to do anything. When Trevor Rohn came back to, to, to Jamaica from his studies overseas um, in the, in the mid-1970s, Trevor, along with Ivan Brewster, giving some history here now, and Munir Zaka and some other folks, mm. started what they call Theater 77. Ivan convinced her, trick, well, Ivan said convinced her, her father said tricked him into using his, 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 car, his car garage to convert it into a theater. And these are, all, these are all pillar playwrights of the Jamaican state. Oh, oh absolutely. Ivan, Munir, Trevor Rohn, these Absolutely. are serious, serious. This would be almost like the trifecta of the, the Ed Bullins, Lorraine Hansberry, um, James Baldwin trifecta we're talking about for the yeah. Jamaican state. Okay, all right, here we go. Yeah, Group of 77 pioneered the use of small spaces to do theater. Either two, it would have been the World Theater and then the Little Theater. Mm -hmm. Those were the, the, the theater. And the creative arts. And, and, and creative arts. Um, well, even before creative arts, there was a whole dramatic, dramatic theater. theater, yes, at UWA, yeah. Right. Um, so, but Theater 77 at the barn kind of pioneered the use of small spaces. Trevor wanted somewhere where he could do his productions in, in, a, in, a, in what he called an economical way. Um, small cast, um, smaller audiences, but still work. The barn theater had a capacity of 150 people, and it would run typically, a good play in Jamaica would typically run for about three months. If you did a three month run, five days per week, you would have done very well. Then came along a gentleman called, called um, Hugh King at the same barn. And Hugh King was on air, very popular as a Captain King on, on RGR and he had a large following. And Hugh King is the first person that had productions, not five, but every single night at the barn, Twice on Saturdays, twice on Sundays. Wait, wait, wait. Out, let's do the math here. Every single night. Seven days a week. Yes. Matinee and evening on Saturday and so Wait a, a minute. Absolutely. Wait. I kill him there, I try to kill him. No, no but <laughs> we, all we, we all loved it. It, it. it was unknown, un unheard of. It is. To be able to see a full audience before you every night, watching theater, enjoying themselves. And, um, but even then, it would run for three months. Uh, we thought, okay, when we sum it all up, that came to about 9,000 people. Mm. And we said there must be more than 9,000 people in the corporate area across Jamaica who would want to see a good quality production. Mm -hmm. And having your own space would have been key to success. And so those are the two critical factors that we thought would be, would, would, would be the pillar of, of, of our success. Luckily, we, we, we found a space at Center Stage um, which could accommodate 250 people. Um, we didn't believe that it was just about putting a production on. We said we didn't believe we needed to do more than two solid productions each year. Um, a kind of theater season had kind of developed out of the pantomime tradition of a boxing day opening. Day after Christmas. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we plugged into that tradition. We didn't believe that we necessarily need to re recreate the wheel. And we would run that down until about the end of June. We'd rehearse again in July, and we'd be on the boardwalks again towards the end of July for a summer production, which would complete the cycle to take us back into our Christmas production. And we started that in 1998, and I've been doing that successfully since for the 20 odd years, 20 odd years since, since, since then. Um, we, we have a very, a very simple philosophy. We're selling a product. The product has got to be attractive. The product has got to be what people want. The product has to satisfy our own principles and our own standards. It's no different from Tasty selling patties. It's no different from Grace Kennedy selling a good um, tomato um, ketchup. We just believe that it's just a different product with a different name and different ingredients. But to go to market, you have to have a product which is attractive. 
mm -hmm. product that people would want to consume. People would want to part with their hard-earned dollars to get utility out of this, out of this product. Mm -hmm. They want to come to see the product in a comfortable space. They want to see a product which will entertain them. They want to see a product where they could um, enjoy with family. Um, and, and so we, we went about crafting that product mm -hmm. and, to, and to give it to them. And we think we've not done, we have not too, done too bad a job at it at all. So that has, in, in a nutshell, has been our philosophy. You remind me a lot of Barry Gordy, all three of you. You remind me of Barry Gordy in the early days of Motown. That was it, you know? Is this as good, is this play or is this song in the case of Barry Gordy? Um, legend has it that he wouldn't release a song in, unless, in the, as I said, legend, okay? I don't know if it's true, I heard, through the grapevine. <laughs> you get it? Pun intended. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I heard that G Mr. Gordy would um, test the song up against a, a person who was hungry. Would you, if, if you were hungry and you had one dollar and it was between this song and a burger, which one would you buy? And if they didn't, if the person didn't say the song, he wouldn't release the song. If they said the burger, he wouldn't release the song. So the idea was that the art had to be as good as the bare necessities of life, food, clothes, and shelter, and it had to be top quality. You just also like to add to, yeah. sorry, just like to add to um, Lenny's point that very important in your business model is branding, as he mentioned, but mm -hmm. also building goodwill. So your standards have to be at a certain level constantly. Your product, your cast, your professionalism, everything has to be up there and maintained over the 20-something years. So that it reached a point now where someone will come off the plane at Norman Manley, as you mentioned earlier, and will come straight to New Kingston and say, um, could I get two tickets for whatever is on tonight? Wow. Because it's at center stage. They know Patrick Brown has written it. They know Glenn Campbell is probably in it. That is goodwill. That is branding. And it's something that you have to cherish and maintain in business. Customer loyalty. And yeah, the most, 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 most definitely. Yeah. Um, product, the quality of the product has to be of such. Like, for example, we would, like a Deborah here, at, we'd bring her to Jamaica and we do a show because we think the, the, the quality of the show is that good. A, a Jambi show, for example, if, if, if we particularly like a Jambi show and we have a Florida base, we would take a Jambi show to Florida, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we, as I say, we have no qualms in the production we do as long as it's a quality production. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you bring, you bring up Florida. Um, as uh, Glenn taught me the other day, Kingston 21. Is, is, is that's is right. All of South Florida. And, I, and that, for those of you who don't know, I think what are their um, 20 municipalities in Kingston proper, right? Kingston 1 to 20? No, 20, right. postal, 20 postal zones. 20 postal You see, it's what happened when you leave. It's one, you know? it's one municipality, <laughs> but 20 postal zones. Thank you, sir. So there are 20 postal zones. So the joke is that Miami is Kingston 21. Indeed. Um, <laughs> so you bring up... And New, York, uh, and New York is fast becoming Kingston 22. Okay. I don't know where Boston is, but we're growing. We're growing. <laughs> we're going to be Kingston 50, but we're so you're, rich. No, you're making it to the 30s. <laughs> so you bring up this touring <laughs> model, which is where I want to go next, Andrew um, and, and, and Glenn. Um, correct, correct me and strip me out here, because one of the things I love about Jamaica's arts culture, music culture, is the sound systems, right? And the sound systems would start in Kingston, but they would have these big trucks that would travel all over the island. And, and if you had a, a stone love in Kingston, you would still get a stone love dance in Clarendon or in Old Arbor, up in the, in the bushes where my people are from. And you would still even be able to get stone love in New York at the same time that Stone Love is still playing in Kingston. So, and I also was able to experience this in this type of pattern with your um, theater. You would have the, the show in Kingston and then multiple productions running at the same time all over the island and some even touring internationally. Tell us about that touring model and how that touring model helps to grow your brand and also helps you to meet your, it doesn't meet or beat your bottom line. Right. Um, for, for, for Whirlwind, we like to tour 
for ourselves in that we, we will take the shows overseas and produce it ourselves. Um, in that way, you have a greater control of a lot of things. As I say, Whirlwind, as a theater group, we are far beyond that. We, we have other products. So, for example, we take a play, Tekiana for me or whatever, to Florida or to New York. We can brand it with all our other products. So New York get to see not just a good play, but good products from Whirlwind. We might we 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 have so many other stuff that we can brand a play with. So we'd like to take our shows on the road ourselves. I mean we do New York, we do Florida, we do England, we do countless of places as a whirlwind product, a whirlwind show. Um, not to say we won't sell shows to people because there are areas that you're not familiar with and things like that. So if a producer there wants to do a show, um, we will sell them a, 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 a show. But mm -hmm. we particularly like to do the shows ourselves. So it's not it's not a presenting model. You literally build a show in the towns that you go to, as opposed to yes, have to and, and, it and, and somebody uh, can pick up. We try to. We try to do these shows as events, not just not just a play, but an event where people will come and people will enjoy themselves. They can buy um, a good Jamaican gizada, a good Jamaican book, mm -hmm. a good Jamaican whatever, because we take products with us also that we can market. Awesome. So, you know, you... Just to follow up on Andrew's point, Akiba. Yes, sir. In the early days, Jambiz would, as Andrew said, we probably sell a show to someone out of town, for argument's sake. Mm -hmm. After a while, we realized that we were bearing the blunt of the cost of producing the show because we have to deal with the truck, we have to pull down the lights on the set and have a crew go down and put the, all of this up. We had to pay actors and um, put them up sometimes, depending on how far and if we're doing like the western side of the island. And so after a while, when we realized that to take a show outside of center stage to any part, anywhere else in Jamaica, could run you anywhere from 300000 to half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And you can start collect at the gate yet. Mm -hmm. This is upfront cost to produce the show, to carry. And so we said, um, it would be better that we take the risk and hopefully make whatever profit there was to make. And so this is how it evolved where... As Andrew said, we had greater control over it. We know where we were going. We would have a, a head team that would go and look at the um, venue, look how much seats would be, we'd be able to put in there. Um, Lenford and his crew would be doing the marketing and we're doing billboards and town criers. And so much goes into putting on probably just one show for one night. Mm -hmm. We spend so much money, but if you do it properly, you can see your way at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So for overseas, it was the same thing. Now, Worldwind, fortunately, has some more um, connections maybe overseas than we do. But we have a set of people that we work with, South Florida. We have people in New York. We had people in Boston. So various Canada, various places that we have connections that they will be the ones that do the groundwork in terms of the producing and the promotion of the show. And then we said, okay, the show will cost you $100 and you pay the airfare, you put us up, you buy the material to build the set, mm -hmm. you take the risk, you just pay us, we'll come and do the show for you. So Jambiz utilizes a producing model where you build a show in Jamaica and, the, and a presenting model where um, companies can book you like they would book an artist, like they can book right. Dean Man on tour or book Sizzla on tour. And it's a little bit less expensive for them to bring you, to, to book you on that presenting model than them trying to build that show in, um, in, in their own town. And it is also less expensive for you because you're able to recoup your money through touring. So the money you spend in Jamaica, you're able to recoup that by, from um, booking fees overseas. So that's the model that you all are working on? Yes. Awesome. Then, Eric, yeah, as, as he said, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a combination. It includes that, that modality. Okay. So it's a, it's, a, it's a combination. Okay. Okay. You know, one of the, the, as we talk about touring, I remember as a, that the, the Jamaican plays would come to the Strand. 
And the Strand Theater, now you know you're talking to producers because producers talk in, in two numbers. We talk in um, box office draw and we talk in, in house size. So you'll, you'll, you've heard these producers so far, 250 seat theater, 200. Anytime they start counting the seats, you know what they're doing. So the Strand Theater was 1,400 seats in the 90s. It's probably a little less now. And I remember the theater used to be full to the rafters um, when, when you guys would come into town. So um, it's definitely a great model utilizing uh, marketing that's close to the people. Um, not so much the traditional. I, I, I didn't see your marketing in the Boston Globe. But if I went into um, a Jamaican restaurant, the flyers would be everywhere. If I'm listening to WERS, to the reggae show, you all would be on the, on the, on the, um, on, on the radio station. So you all were able to effectively reach the massive subculture of the Caribbean diaspora in the US. And it's a subculture that the premier theater companies, the Huntington's, the Arts Emerson's are not able to reach. Tell us a little bit about your ability to reach that subculture? What is the aesthetic? What are the cultural specificities that you all are speaking to? Without giving up your trade secrets, Lenford, I'm not gonna pull all your trade secrets from you, but how do you reach that subculture? Because in Jamaica, excuse me, in Boston, the Caribbean community is about 44% of the immigrant population here. How do we get them into the theaters? Yeah, it's not um, it's not trade secrets actually. It's 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 well known. Um, in fact, where it's not just theater, but where Caribbean culture work in that main market is where you have good, um, where you have good ethnic media mm -hmm. existing in the different locations. It used to be the easiest place to market a Caribbean product. Now, is South Florida. Why? Because you have diaspora ethnic um, platforms in that area. You'll have a radio waves, which is very popular in the South Florida area. When we, when we lost WLIB in New York, um, if you live in New York, you would have known Gil Bailey and WLIB and Jeff mm -hmm. Barnes and so on. Caribbean media was very popular and the plays and, 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 and Caribbean artists would do so much better reggae artists, soccer artists, and so on, would have done so much better because they had the WLIB platform to swim on. We lost WLIB, and since then, we have not been able to get into any mainstream ethnic Caribbean media to replace it, and that has been significant. Mm. Replacing it, though, has been a lot of what is known as pirate <laughs> stations, these underground stations with vast listenership. We are, but those primarily work for the reggae shows mm. um, rather than for, for theater. There's another dynamic which you mentioned, like in the Strand, in the Strand area. We, we, we used to work with a gentleman which runs Everybody's Caribbean magazine, a gentleman called yeah. Herman Hall yeah, in New York. Herman is the one who used to produce the show in Boston. Mm -hmm. Now, Herman himself had to work with a local producer in the Boston area because he would not have had the footprints himself mm -hmm. in Boston mm -hmm. to pull it off. And so he would have worked with local people in the area who know the mom and pop shops, who know where to go to leave the flyers, who know where most people go. You have to get on the ground. You, um, when, when a lot of people, um, I've seen people envy Herman all for having a successful, um, Brooklyn College was, 20, was 2,300 people, right? And Herman all would fill that space and fill Lehman College in the Bronx with 2,300 people, and I've stood out there and hear people envy Herman Hall in filling those spaces. But they don't know the kind of work that Herman had to put in. I mean, Andrew can tell you, Andrew would spend a week or two with Herman in that New York area. You have got to be at Jamaica Center in that cold, handing out flyers day in, day out to catch the Jamaican audience because we, don't, we no longer have a double LIB to get that word out. Herman had to use ways. His magazine did help because he did have a good subscriber base to his Everybody's Caribbean magazine, and that was his strength. But even then, Herman had to stand um, with, with those guys, um, Andrew would assist from time to time, and stand up at that subway entrance, mm -hmm. handing flyers out. You had to beat the pavement to get those 2,300 people 
into Brooklyn College, into Lehman College, into Queens College. Wow. So it, it, there, there are many layers. There are, there's no one size fit all for the different areas. Different, different strategies would have to be used to, to fill different spaces. Like I said, Rowling has a great, Rowling's greatest base is actually in Florida because Mikey is from, is from Florida. So Michael knows that area like the back of his hands. Mm -hmm. It's more difficult for him to produce, say, in New York or, or, or Orlando. or he, I mean, he would never even dream of, of, of tackling a Boston all by himself at all. Well, so assuming that one part of the model is this... Let me, let me, don't, don't say that because we have done. We have, this is the thing is, like, like you say with Herman, Herman All, um, I, for one, has learned from Herman All. And Michael Doss is one of those persons who is like Herman All, who would go and foot it and, and give out the flyers himself day after day after day. Um, Grant, you, I'll, I'll give you that some places you need, you need um, people on the ground, right? But believe me, we have a crew that does their research, make the links, and it works. So you have an informal partnership model in, in, when it comes to touring in some of these foreign countries. Oh, no, it's quite formal, you know. It's not oh, it's quite, okay, all right, quite formal. Uh, tell us a little... We don't, work, we don't work at all unless we have a, a, a signed contract in place. Because okay. we're doing a business. We operate as, as, as a strict business. And when I say um, informal, uh, I'm thinking about some of the... the, um, the there, are large, there are large theaters in many of these towns, right, that can present plays that pick plays from the touring circuits because shows touring all over the world. Um, and so as far as actual uh, other theater producers in these towns, you all are not working through those particular theater producers. You are working through the, the merchants and the people who are closest to that community. Um, well, it's, not because, it's not because we wouldn't want to be known. Right, so that's where their, I'm going to go. Business, their business yeah. model would not fit our business model because they're primarily marketing their, those shows to a, to a mainstream market where our language would not necessarily communicate to that market. So if oh. we were to go to a mainstream producer in Boston, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they would not be interested in doing our play because their market is different. What, what, so what do we do? So let me tell you one of the shifts that's happening in theater all over the world, especially in the U.S. and, and, and also in Boston, is that the mainstream is shifting. As a matter of fact, two, two weeks ago when we were talking with Anya Gludon and Miss Faye Ellington and Dr. Hickling Gordon, we talked about the fact that the mar people who were in the margins and all the stories that were in the margins are now the stories that are on the main stage, the main page. Um, the, the narrative is now in the margin. So one of the things that's yeah, but there's still a, but there's still a distinction, um, Akiba. There's still a distinction even in that, you know. Mm -hmm. Because coming from the margin can come from different margins. There's no one mm -hmm. margin. Of course. So you may that come from the margin in Boston to come to mainstream Boston. But to come from the margin or even mainstream Jamaica, and go to mainstream Boston is a completely different analysis. What would need to happen if we, it, what would that transition look like? And I'm more talking about the, can't, let me be very direct. Can a whirlwind, what would need to happen to make a whirlwind production say um, it stops here or um, a love games from um, jam Bays? Uh, what would need to happen for that to be on the stage of, say, the Paramount or uh, in Boston or um, Roundabout Theater in New York? Because things it's are really very, very simple. It's really yeah, very sir. simple. Patrick mm -hmm. Bone write about universal themes. Okay. We, 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 we craft a production based on audience mm -hmm. in what will work with a particular audience. If Patrick Brown knows that this play is going to be presented to non-Jamaicans in Boston, Mm -hmm. The same themes, we, it will be presented in a completely different way. Take, for instance, Patrick has three versions. One of Patrick's first play was a play called December. Patrick has, about, Patrick has two distinct versions of December. There's a December which is set in Jamaica with, with, with the Jamaican dialect. Mm -hmm. And then there's a December which was written, actually, we were in discussions with Ozzy Davis and Ruby Dee, 
to actually produce this Casa Tuhanda with two old people mm. um, to set December in New York with Ozzy D and, 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 and Ozzy D and Ruby Davis in New York. Patrick had to go back through that play and restructure that play language wise in terms of what were the cultural references. Uh, um, December speaks about the game of cricket. Cricket is a West Indian. Americans know absolutely nothing about cricket. Wait, 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 I, I kind of disagree somewhat, and I'll tell you why. The music, for example, the, 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 Jamaic, the music that is done in the Jamaican dialect, cross all boundaries. Whether you're, you're a white American, whether you're from Europe, it cross all boundaries, and they sing them line for line. So no, in terms of, the, in terms of a play, it, they might take longer to pick up on certain of the jokes and all the rest of it. If we feed it to them like like the reggae music is fed to them, they will buy into it, you know. They, I don't believe in watering down the dialect because that is the authentic Jamaican piece that we want to sell, the dialect. The language. Right? So I, Let I me tell you, I mean, I mean um, uh, that, that, that's your view, Andrew, but it's not supported by, 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 by what's out there. Let me tell you, years ago, you see, after I, I, I was in third world Cup. And I was in Dance Hall Queen, um, Dance Hall Queen. I was in all those Jamaican movies. I walked into Virgin down in, 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 um, in Times Square, where they put them in the Virgin circuit to sell. Mm -hmm. And we went up to the Clark because we particularly wanted to know how much of, of it was sold. The guy went to the box office and checked and told us that in two years, five copies were sold. And he said, my friend, Americans, are, they're not going to buy this because they don't understand the language. You're making a fundamental error by using the music. The music is different. Half the people don't even understand. The you know why Bombay? You know how Bombay by got Butch Banton into trouble? When a, when when a Jamaican yeah, we know, we know hold on, but, when a Jamaican homosexual group alerted the American as to what Bombay by meant, and immediately Butch Banton became enemy number one, and all mm. the homosexuals. Mm -hmm. in, in, in all across the world mm -hmm. were singing boom bye bye until they, they didn't know what they were saying until they found out because of the language so you bringing it back watch into, a play a yeah. play or a movie depends on you understanding story you can understand the music without Lenny. understanding one solitary Lenny. word in it Lenny. but i'm saying and, no, but i'm saying andrew that's your view which i respect which is fine and it's an interesting view and uh, i'm gonna lean in oliver samuels yeah bbd has crossed over into in, into into into. You know you're muted absolutely, there. Absolutely, absolutely incorrect. Because that's some, not correct. That's not okay. correct. Okay, what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna Andrew, no, hold on one that's, minute. No, that's, and, that's, hold that's on. not correct. Benford, hold on one moment. I'm gonna um, just keep driving this conversation in a way that um, will allow some different perspectives to come to fore. I think that's a good point about the language. And um, and what music does because music music is rhythmic. Sometimes you don't even have to understand. I listen to a lot of world music. I listen to a lot of music from Brazil, from France, from China. I listen to everything, and I don't know what they're saying. So you make a great point, Lenford, about the distinction between music and what happens to narrative in music, and what happens to narrative or story in theater and literary arts because theater is a literary art. It is. And, but one of the things that I, I, I kind of I want to kind of poke down, Andrew, I'm going to let you in again. One minute. Um, I want to set up this for you here, Andrew. One of the things that I'm seeing in the industry across the board is that groups of people are wanting to, and when I talk about the margins, what's happening is people who were in those marginalized communities are coming out and saying, we are not going to be marginalized. We're not going to be subordinated groups. And, and these theaters in these towns are nonprofit theaters. And they are theaters that belong to the people. And we, the people, our, our group of people, Caribbean people, um, Asian people, whoever, wherever we're from, we've been left out of these theaters. So what's happening? What's actually happening, guys, is that a lot of producers are looking for the work. And one of the challenges is that they don't know the work, they don't know the culture. So let's focus more on the, the, the story 
and um, what parts of a story, because you can adapt language. Some of the things that we do at Art Emerson, we do surtitles. We actually, in, in, in the theater, in a lot of touring plays, because we bring plays from Poland, we bring plays from Chile, we have a company coming out of South, from Soweto that does opera, and they do it in their language, they do it in-house style, they, you know, they're not adapting to English, and they're keeping their South African culture within the, the presentation of a Verdi opera, you know? And so what I'm wanting to get into here, maybe even throwing this over to Glenn as an actor, um, the, the story, the narrative arc, and I like what you were saying, Lenford, about those adaptations. And man, that production of December with Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee would have been fantastic. Um, what are the aspects of Jamaican culture that one would see in the plays that you produce? And when I say aspects, the aesthetic, what is it about Jamaican culture that one is able to feel? If you're able to sit still, whether you understand or don't understand, what are y'all doing that's driving the audience? What will I feel as an audience member in a Jamaican play? Just want to focus it there for a sec. All right, so um, we're speaking about, as Lenford mentioned, a lot of our plays, Patrick Brown written scripts, deal with universal subject matters, mm -hmm. um, whether it be Ladies of the Night, or whether it be um, Ras Noah and the Ark, which looks at the Bible story of Noah and um, building yeah. up the Ark, whatever it is. But the Jamaican nuances um, are specific to the West Indian culture and the Jamaican people in terms of the language structure, mm -hmm. in terms of even some of the jokes and what we find funny, um, certain people won't find funny. So you have to be specific to your target audience. Mm -hmm. You have to know who you're marketing to. And then um, they will, how the market builds and spreads is they bring someone, okay, there's a Jamaican who lives in Chicago and they marry a black American and they bring them along to the show and they will be there and they're sitting and sitting in that space with whether it's 2000 people laughing heartily at something. And they'll, 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 they'll pick up something and they'll lean over to their Jamaican and say, um, I know something very funny is happening right here. I'm not sure what it is, but it looks and feels good. There's a feel to it. There's, mm -hmm. there's a rhythmic, a, a kind of pattern to how we speak and how we move. A lot of our comedy is very physical. So whether you're not understanding everything that we say directly, how we move, the facial expressions, the mm -hmm. tone, tonal quality of the voice mm. is what we do that makes it so much fun, so much, so interesting, that holds the audience and draws them in. Yeah, we, we take it everywhere. And so even if they do not understand every single nuance, every single line, they get in the gist of the story. Mm. You know, so you're talking about the use of spectacle and gesture, okay. and production quality, sound, lights, Costuming, the, you know, it, to your point, Glenn, I had the opportunity to see a production of Endgame, which is Irish, um, is it in, yeah, Endgame, in, in, in Italian, and I don't speak any Italian, and it was a Robert Wilson play, and Robert Wilson is known for these grand productions, great use of color and space and lighting, and, and for some reason, halfway in, without, and without not, and to be honest, not really knowing Endgame. I didn't know the play either. I didn't finish reading it. I was, I was one of those scholars that spent more time in the theater than in the classroom myself, but um, knew of the play, um, knew the storyline, but didn't know every, every part. And after a while, I was able to, to achieve it. This, this, this um, conversation on language is something that's happening across the board with a lot of different cultures. Um, so you, so if, you, if you all are agreeing with me, you, yes, know, you don't know, you don't, because because people will enjoy the piece. They will follow it as, as best they can. As Glenn rightly say, there's something rhythmic about us Jamaican in terms of how we speak and with the action, with the whole composition of the piece. Mm -hmm. People don't really have to understand every single word, but they will follow it. So mm -hmm. I am saying, if people are prepared to sit and even try to follow it, why do we want to water down the language to change okay. the authentic Jamaican brand, which I think that is what we should be selling, apart from the story of the play. Because people will, you will watch a karate movie for argument's sake. 
you don't know anything about Chinese or Japanese, but you enjoy the movie because you are following it. There's a, yeah, there's some, that's where I'm coming from. No, it's a good point, and it, you know, it's a it's a worthwhile argument because it's one of the ways that um, people are looking and trying to figure out when we talk about diversifying the theater. Um, people are looking for new stories. There's also an opportunity for learning, for learning new cultures and learning new things and leaning in. Um, I want to transition into um, where we are today in, in the theater and the opportunities that even though the theaters are closed and they're closed all over the world, what are the, what are the opportunities now um, as we stand, as I said earlier in the introduction, as we stand waiting in the wings, waiting in the wings for theater spaces to open up again, waiting in the wings to see um, will these vaccines work, waiting in the wings to see uh, what will social distancing look like um, in, the, in the next six months. The question here is what will need to happen in order for theater to re-emerge in Jamaica and in the Caribbean diaspora. Um, what could that growth look like? And what, what are the steps that would need to happen? And what could the growth look like post, or I, I don't want to say post, I would say in this pandemic era. I think we're in an era of, of things right now. Question for Glenn. And, and don't be too hard on the audience. We know so we love run up and down and break the law and go apart <laughs> we never go. But you know, a dance hall and we can't live without it. So talk to us. Tell me what needs to happen for us. No, I, I, I think um, theatre will remain alive because live theatre is live theatre and mm -hmm. there's no substitution for it. Um, yes, we're moving and diversifying and getting into online platforms and um, recording shows and putting, up, putting them up for pay-per-view or pay-on-demand. But the fact is that live theatre is live theatre. So it will survive. It has to survive. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain magic about the interaction between an audience and actors on stage in a live performance that you'll never be able to capture on film. And so we, we, we just have to keep working, first of all, to keep our minds and our spirits active. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't lose heart. We, we can't stay home and get despondent and decide that we're going to give up. Mm -hmm. um, so all of us have been out of work. I've been off stage since, pretty much since March 12 of this year. And the fact is I'm dying, I'm dreaming of the day when I can go back to my eight shows a week schedule. But until then, I have to find other things to do. So keep my mind active, watch productions, read scripts. Um, and in the meantime, keep in touch with our audiences. Mm. With anything else, um, you can get forgotten very quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you need to keep in touch with your audiences. God bless social media. It wasn't around when I started, but it's here now. So there are things we can do and we have to do to keep in touch with audiences. Let them know we're still here. Um, remind them of work that we've done before. Probably put out snippets of stuff. Keep in touch. Keep the dialogue going. Keep the communication open. You know, you would, it's interesting that you would say that. We just have a comment from um, Yard Empire. He just popped up in the comments saying, Jambiz International is Jamaica's number one successful theater. I'm not throwing any shots over there, Andrew. It's Jamaica's number one su uh, <laughs> successful theater simply because they understand their audience in Jamaica and globally. So it's interesting that you would talk about, you have to keep that relationship and that dialogue between the art and the audience going no matter what. Speaking of which, Andrew, uh -huh. you have figured out a model or a, a new platform, relatively new platform, you've been doing it for a while, well, that yeah, um, is, is able not, to allow you to do that. Tell us about Jamaica Online TV. All right, it's not figuring out. Um, Michael Dawson mm -hmm. had the vision long before a COVID that mm -hmm. um, in order to get the material that we want out, the mm -hmm. type of material we want out, we had to have our own platform, as in supposed to going to other um, platforms to do our material. If we have our own platform, then we can do just about anything we want. We can put in any commercials, anything at all we want on online TV, hence Jamaica Online TV. Um, 
Jamaica Online TV is is um, a, a whirlwind platform. Actually, we just finished shooting the Oliver Samuels three episodes of Oliver back on TV for his 50th year in theater, which will be aired on um, from the 26th through to the 29th. On just you can just log in on Jamaica Online TV for a cost, and mm -hmm. you can watch it anytime you want, just for a one-time cost. It's four days. Just log on to Jamaica Online TV and you'll be able to see Oliver back on TV after several years. So the platform is there. And Lenny, we have an open door policy, as you know. If we're, if Jambis has a product that you want to co go on online, we can stream live, we can do a recorded feed, whatever. We're open for dialogue. Uh, just about any other theater fraternity. Because as Glenn really said, we have to keep ourselves current. We mm -hmm. have to stay in the eyes of people or else we'll be forgotten, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing, as Glenn rightly say, as live theater, but we can't do live theater now. So we have to um, do the option, the, 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 the other best thing, and which is to stream them to our audience. So people can look out for Oliver Samuels back on Jamaica Online TV. And it's not accidental why he chose Jamaica Online TV to... to come back on television. It's because of our track record and all the rest of it. We have worked with Oliver over the years and he knows what we have in terms of products and all the rest of it. So let's help welcome Oliver back to television and Jamaica Online. Speaking of visibility, staying visible, we were we were so happy to have you, Glenn, but also to have <clears throat> Mr. Samuels on the conversation on in our first week. Um, you know, so it's great to see the artists responding to the call. Um, I'm gonna throw this to, to Lenford. We have um, a school teacher in the audience um, and she's, she's really making a, a rallying cry. Uh, she says here, Miss uh, Nadette Grant Malcolm, she says that as a theater arts teacher, we are in a tight spot right now. The children will not be able to see a live production this time around. Jambage Productions, we need you. So we're seeing that this um, many in, in the, the, the streaming platform, the on-demand model, which is one one that we're using right now because we're using two two on-demand platforms. We're using HowlRound and we're using YouTube as we speak. Um, have you thought about an on-demand model? And I also would love for you to speak to uh, what are some of the structural elements that needs to be in place for theater to not just return, emerge, but to thrive and grow? Because there's always room for growth. Lenford. Um, a number of um, dots been thrown. So let me perhaps have to separate them and answer, answer individually. In terms of an online presence, um, we, we, we are actively looking to, to, to get into that space as well. Um, <clears throat> we're not quite sure when we'll be able to get back in an enclosed space to do theater. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is obviously not unique to theater, to all entertainment, to all businesses worldwide. Yeah. Um, if, if Pfizer and, and, and the other companies do get a vaccine there quick, quickly enough, uh, perhaps towards the middle of the year, we, we probably will get back into that, into that space. So we are, we, are, we are actively looking. We are... Um, Exploring a few options at this time. We, we, we only recently just recorded um, one of our productions. Mm -hmm. We do have some productions that had already been recorded and we're looking to see if we can get back into that space, certainly by Christmas and announcement will come soon. So Simon, mm -hmm. let us talk, let us talk. Oh, absolutely. We, we're, not, we're not ruling out, we're not ruling out any, any, any option at all. Ever the businessman, Andrew. Ever absolutely. the businessman. Watch oh, absolutely. you. <laughs> Go ahead, Lenford. Once the platform is there, we are interested to, 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 to explore it. Um, we, 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 we have been not as um, eager to get off the back as many others have been because there are certain standards that we've set ourselves and that we, we, we wanted to ensure was in place. We don't necessarily believe in taking one camera into a space and, and, and record a production and put it online. Um, it, that works for some people. It, it, it doesn't quite satisfy some of the standards we have set for ourselves. And so we try to put some more production elements to it. And that does take a little more time and a little more resources to make it happen. 
Yes, the resources, okay. Lenny, the resources. Yeah, the resources. Mm -hmm. um, but time is also a resource, right? Um, so that kind of took a little more time than the usual. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that we are pretty close to, to having something that, so, well, some things that we can put into that space, and we're looking to do that perhaps um, over, the, over the upcoming holiday period. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of theater generally, um, live theater, as we know, was before movies, before mm -hmm. the advent of, of cinema. Um, a lot of people said movies would have killed live theater. It didn't. Um, when VHS came, people said, ha, cinema, VHS is going to not only kill um, live theater, it is also going to kill cinemas. Mm. It never happened. Mm -hmm. When DVD came, they said, okay, this is it. No, it's going to kill them all. It hasn't. There's just an allure mm -hmm. about live theater that perhaps will never die. Yeah. I mean, and, and when I say live theater, it includes concerts, by the way. It includes music concerts, because that is theater. Mm -hmm. um, we, can go on, we can go and watch Michael Jackson music videos. We can look at his, we can listen to his album. But if he goes to Madison Square Garden, we line up in the cold to go in to see Michael in theater on stage. That's the allure of live performance, live theater that will never die. Mm -hmm. So we do believe theater is on a recess, theater is only on a break, that once people get over the fear of gathering in a space, and you don't know if the person sitting beside you is a COVID carrier, once we get beyond that point, I do believe that theater will come back as strong as it, as it ever been, as it has ever been. But do not believe that it's a panacea. It's not just about people going back in the space. Mm -hmm. What would have worked pre-COVID is what is going to work post-COVID. Proper marketing, having a good product on stage, that is what people are willing to part with their hard hern funds to see, and mm -hmm. that will not change. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, you, you talk about the power or the dynamic of live performance. I've been watch, listening to Nina Simone probably since I was in the womb. And then I had the opportunity to see her last concert before she passed away. God rest her soul. And she was quite, you know, she, she was, she was um, quite on in years. And then she sat down at the piano to play Mississippi Goddamn. And we're in an outside um, amphitheater down by the waterfront in Boston. Some of you all may know it. And she sits, and I've, I've been listening to the song my entire life. And then just the first mm, on the piano, and then she starts, something happens. Mm -hmm. Something happens that there are no words. You, you really have to, it's sensory. It happens in the senses. You, you, it's not speech. It cannot be articulated what happens with live theater. So I agree with you. I mean, people, get, people get into a frenzy to see Michael Jackson on stage. But that same, move, happens. that same move was in the thriller. What, the same move is in the thriller um, music video. But when you just thriller on stage, it goes crazy. And I know how the moonwalk probably better than Michael Jackson, but I, still, times. <laughs> but I still go to see him. You know, and exactly. also I agree with you one hundred percent, gentlemen. And you know, the the plague. The theaters have been closed before. The theaters were closed during the plague. Um, the Black Plague in its era. So the theaters will come back. I have one final question for you before we close out our session. This has been amazing. And I'm coming it's to not, you guys. It's not 4.30. We're almost, we're almost, we're almost out of here. Um, no, I we, didn't know the time had flown so fast. I thought you had only gone half an hour. Because the conversation is so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. And, and me, you know, I put on my rice and peas and I love my food, so I won't go eat my dinner. No. <laughs> so, um, you gentlemen, you came up in the theater as young people. And my advice to you, since we know say, not, uh, Jamaicans have a saying, a saying that says, what don't dash, what don't spoil, or something, I may be getting it wrong. Get it? You're speaking to Glenn and Andrew, are you? <laughs> 
Poor me, little English boy. That me. <laughs> Maybe I see you again, you know. We are seeing okay. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, um, what do we say to the young people? The the young we we're in about two or three weeks, we're gonna be our, our topic is called leaders of a new stage. The young, uh, the next generation of administrators, of producers, of directors in the Jamaican space. My question to you, gentlemen, as we close out. Um, and thinking about the teachers in our audience, things regenerate, things recreate themselves over time. What would you say to that young aspiring producer, whether it's a record producer, a theater producer, a, a young um, merchant producer like yourself, Andrew? What would you say to somebody somewhere in their teens, 20s, 30s, the young 60 year olds, the young 70 year olds that are dreaming of entering and making and bringing art to the people. Any advice for them as we move on in, in the notion of creating and recreating yourself? Okay, well, we've been saying it over and over all afternoon. Um, first of all, you must know your audience. Mm. Two ways about it. Know your audience, be professional, and make sure your product is up to standard that you can stand by it through thick and thin. Because um, a lot of times, Lenford and Patrick, and they say it to us actors all the time, that yes, uh, Glenn Campbell might be in the show or Oliver Samuels might be in the show. And yes, that might add a little something to it in terms of attractability to an audience. But at the end of the day, if Glenn or Oliver is not in the show or somebody else is working that night or understudy for whatever reason, if the product is of a certain standard, people, I've seen it happen. People come to a show, I was slated to be on, and for whatever reason, I wasn't on that night. And, oh, Glenn, not there. And they sit, and they grumble, and they make up their face, and they watch the other actor work his guts out. And then halfway through the show, they start to relax. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the show, they're saying, why, Glenn, never there, but you there, him good. <laughs> Product has to be of such that it will stand on its own. Uncompromising. So stability, quality, and know your audience. Know who you're selling to. Excellent. What would you say, Andrew? All right, definitely. The, the, the quality of the product cannot be compromised in no way, shape, or form. You have to ensure that the quality is of A1 standard. Um, do it from your heart. You have to do it even though you are expecting financial gain. It's something you have to do from your heart. If you don't believe in it, it's not going to work. And as I learned from Oliver Samuels and my CEO, Michael Dawson, professionality is one of the key ingredients. You have to remain professional, prof professional to what you're doing and be sincere. Um, recipe for, for um, success. Keep be sincere and be professional at what you do. Lenford, what's your advice to the next generation, wherever they are in their lives? Yeah, I'd like to add to what Glenn and Andrew said. I endorse all that they have said. I'd like to add to it, Glenn said you need to know the audience. Not only know the audience, you have to listen you have to learn, you have to have the art of listening to your audience and understanding what works for them. Mm -hmm. Now, look, we, we, I, I wanted to have said this earlier. Mm -hmm. Patrick has about three, four, five scripts of, um, that he has written that we have not been able to produce, you know, because we know somebody if there's an audience for it. Um, so we use it more for what we call theater readings on a Sunday morning, for the more artistic set of folks who want to see a nice artistic piece. Um, so Patrick has so many of those scripts, but that are not commercially viable. But my main advice to anybody wanting to come into the arts is, if, you, if your main motive for coming in the arts is to make money, then you've started at the wrong end of the totem. Once you do it right and, and, and put a business approach to it, the returns will come. But you have to pay attention to the other important details first. If your main motive is a money-making motive, then everything else is going to fail behind it. Mm -hmm. Once you get all the elements right, it will reward you 
in the long run. Mm. I want to hold that for a moment. Hold that thought. Some of those elements are preparation. Be well studied, as you heard Linford um, share in his in the earlier part of the conversation about being well studied in in your in your craft. Um, being able to respond to whatever the market needs at any given time, the way you heard Andrew talks about in his business model, he'll sell you he'll sell you a play or a bottle of water. If you show up, he's got something to sell you. Be, do it for the love, be prepared. Um, always be professional, but also be willing to be open to, to something new, as you heard Glenn share earlier in his advice. This has been an amazing conversation. I would, I would be honest with you. I didn't know if I was going to be able to hold my own with you three gentlemen. I was looking at the poster. I said, look at little old me with these three odd back man. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? Am I going to be able to hang in there? You guys have taken me to school and I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I have been taking notes. Trust me. Next week, next Sunday, November 29th at 4 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, we move into week five of 10 weeks in Jamaica. And we're going into the dance hall, dance hall reggae and the Nettleford effect. And when we talk about the Nettleford effect, we're not talking about a specific technique in dance, though, Ms. though Dr. Nettleford uh, was the founder of the National Dance Theater of Jamaica. We're talking about the mindset and the scholarship and the, the directive around owning one's culture, knowing one's craft, and placing one's um, foot in a solid career path. These are some of the things that uh, Dr. Nettleford um, not just taught his students, but really um, proselytized throughout Jamaican culture. So we're going to look at the impact of dance hall reggae, dance hall culture. We heard a little bit of it come up today with, with Buju's song, and the philosophies of Rex Nettleford, the great Rex Nettleford. We will be speaking with the dance hall professor, the dancing professor himself, Mr. Orville Hall. We will be speaking with the artistic director of the National Dance Theater of Jamaica, Marlon Sims. And we will be speaking with the ever, ever, ever present and profound Neela Ebex next week at 4 p.m. here on our YouTube channel and on HowlRound.com. You heard me say this before, or maybe you're hearing me say it for the first time. Jamaican people, when we leave you, we say what good. When I say bye-bye, we say what good, because we want all of your ways and your pathways to be good. And we theater people, especially us actors, we say, see you on the boards, which means see you at the next job. So I'm going to close out by saying, what good on the board.